Put Perfect. a smile and hope I look nice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then you can hear me. Okay, all right. We're going to go live right now. Great. Uh, and I think we're live in theory. Usually I require some kind of external uh, confirmation from somebody out there in the audience to let me know that we are actually functioning. Um, but so who are you? What do you do? Great. Uh, so my name is Matthew Campbell. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Penn, University of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And uh, I largely build really small things. Uh, to put that more precisely, uh, I use uh, techniques called uh, micromanufacturing, uh, where we build uh, very small devices. And the applications that I'm mostly interested in are for energy conversion and for uh, propulsion. Uh, and so I can talk more about that. Uh, yeah, but absolutely. That's just a high level overview. Yeah, yeah. So, so you're part of this special group at UPenn, right? The is it the Bagatin group? A uh, Bargatin, yeah. Bargatin yeah, it's group. Professor Igor Bargatin is the yeah. uh, is the pr principal investigator. Yeah. Yeah, and and you have like a a connection with the Breakthrough Starshot initiative. So can you, exactly. can you explain that? Yeah. Um, sorry. Go ahead. You could, or just can you explain how that sort of what that relationship is with Breakthrough Starshot? Sure. Uh, so uh, Breakthrough Starshot is essentially a funding agency, and they've got a big vision uh, to send some kind of a probe from Earth to Proxima Centauri, which is a, um, the, essentially the closest star to Earth, at least right now, uh, within, say, the next 20 or 30 years. And so uh, there's a number of different groups at universities throughout uh, the United States and even the world, I think, that are uh, working on different parts of the problem, what it would take to get a probe uh, from Earth to, to this star system. And uh, our group uh, uh, applied for a grant uh, that has to do with the uh, SAIL. Uh, the idea behind this propulsion is that there's going to be um, uh, an array of lasers on Earth, and I can tell you all about that, or yeah. at least some details if you like. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and those lasers are going to shoot some photons at a, a very lightweight reflective SAIL, and that sail is going to tow a very small chip, about a, a size of a gram, perhaps, uh, at um, roughly a fifth the speed of light all the way to uh, Proxima Centauri. And so our group has been uh, charged with um, working on the design of that sail. And there's a number of critical questions that we've worked on answering, uh, and we've uh, attempted to build some prototypes, and uh, we've thought at a high level about what the sail shape should be, um, so there's a number of things uh, we could go into if you'd like. Yeah, uh, but that's yeah. the general overview of how our group got involved. Right. So, so I mean, right now, the, the sort of the state of solar sails, the, the Japanese had a mission. Um, the Planetary Society has their light sail to mission. I know NASA is, is planning to launch a, a mission that's going to go and study an asteroid and use a light sail. But in general, light sails really haven't been used very much in any kind of practical application, definitely not that much around the solar system. So it's, it's kind of interesting to me that the, the goal is sort of focusing on, say, Proxima Centauri, uh, when this technology could, could be used here in the solar system as well. Uh, so like, what do you think about solar sails as a as a propulsion system, even for exploring the solar system? Do you think they're, they're a good way to go? Sure. Well, I think it all depends on the mission parameters. Um, it, it, solar sails, uh, so just to differentiate from light sails, solar sails are powered by the sun's right. rays. The photons yeah. from the sun, it, they reflect that, and, and they can move around. And the speeds that they can achieve uh, aren't all that great, uh, unless they accelerate for a very long time. But uh, as you suggest, they are somewhat useful for traveling around the solar system. Uh, I mean, my, my personal opinion is that uh, rockets might be a better way to go. At least uh, we can move faster, and, and oftentimes you know, funding uh, can change. And so if you want the mission to be done in a 10-year time span when you have the money to do it, maybe a rocket's a better way to get around. Yeah. But uh, there, there might be uh, applications where solar sails are useful. Uh, perhaps uh, when I'm trying to think about something, if you were going to send something very close to the sun, the flux of photons near the sun is a lot higher. And so mm. perhaps there uh, it, it would be advantageous to use the sun's photons uh, uh, for propulsion. Um, right. but, but certainly uh, if you're working on uh, propulsion around Pluto, there's so little light, the flux of yeah. photons is so little there that a solar cell wouldn't do you much good. Well, so I, I should then apologize because I kind of use the terms 
interchangeably, you know, solar sail, light sail, um, because essentially they're both just bouncing photons and, and using yeah. it as, as a propulsion system. And, and you could imagine both coming into play. Like you could have a solar sail that goes really close to the sun, picks up a vast amount of photons, does like an Oberth maneuver, and then you have lasers giving it additional kicks on the way out and, and sort of have it be combined. So I, so I apologize, you know, if I sort of went into use the term sure. solar sail, but really like even like light sails, you know, don't light sails offer a really like, you know, if you guys can mass produce these things and send out hundreds or thousands that are a few grams, you could explore every single interesting object in the entire solar system within a couple of years, <laughs> right? Well, um, I, I think maybe in theory that's the case. Uh, it, of course, if you can mass produce them, um, there is, of course, the question of uh, how do you actually propel them? And, and that, that requires an enormous array of lasers. Mm -hmm. And it might take quite a bit of time to uh, charge the lasers. They'll probably be powered by some kind of solar panel that, that uh, um, charges a bank of capacitors. It might take you quite a while to charge up those uh, capacitors. So just to give you a, a, a perspective on this, uh, it takes about 100 gigawatts to accelerate uh, one of these chips, 100 gigawatts for over a span of, say, uh, 10 to 30 minutes. So uh, right. the, the Three Gorges Dam in China produces about 20 gigawatts of power. <laughs> it's the largest power station we have on the planet. Right. So you would just need a, an enormous amount of... and so. Uh, you could, in principle, launch maybe one per week, uh, but but then within the solar system, it gets to its target within a few minutes. So yeah. there's the advantage. But right. um, so back to your question: Yes, in principle, if you could if you could uh, mass produce them well and you could shoot them off uh, in enough time, yes, you could send them to very interesting destinations in our solar system. And I think that many people, um, while actually getting to Proxima Centauri, would be an amazing goal. Many people view just getting the technology working for uh, inter-solar uh, system, or maybe I should say intra-solar system travel, uh, to be a, a fine uh, landing spot yeah. for now. All right, so let's talk about the materials involved. So I right. guess for, for a lot of people, I mean, we kind of know roughly how a solar sail works, but can you sort of give us the actual like specifics? What is the what is the process that is allowing a solar sail or a laser sail, um, a light sail, a to to act as a propulsion system? Sure. So um, I'll just uh, use an analogy uh, with uh, perhaps a baseball. Uh, if if you have a baseball and uh, you catch it, then that baseball imparts momentum to the glove, and so that's when the baseball sticks in the glove. If you have a tennis ball and you have a board and the tennis ball comes up and bounces, it imparts some energy and then it rebounds and imparts more energy. And uh, you can think in this case of the ball, either the tennis ball or the baseball as a photon. We have a very lightweight sail uh, and as those photons hit the sail, they impart some momentum. If they're absorbed, that's all you get. But if they reflect off, you get twice the momentum. Mm. And so uh, even though photons are essentially have no mass or very little mass, uh, they can actually impart a force uh, to this solar sail. And that's why we need an enormous amount of power, a very lightweight sail. And uh, because of uh, those two things, we can accelerate this sail to roughly a fifth the speed of light. At least that's what our calculations right. indicate. So, um, so if you had like a solar sail that was black, then you would be getting, say, half the thrust and the thing would be heating yeah. up and melting. But Exactly. It right. would survive for less than a second. Right. But if you had an absolutely perfect mirror, then it wouldn't heat up at all and would just gain the maximum amount of, of increased velocity. You've got it. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Does the does the fact that, that photons are going the speed of light, when I sort of think about my physics training, you know, the formula that goes into it, the the velocity is the one that gets squared. So does the does the fact that they're going light speed really help in the process? Uh, I think so. Uh, I would have to go back to my own let's <laughs> pretend that you had, for example, uh, you know, just little uh, objects moving at some slow speed hitting something. I think in the end, what would happen is the, the fastest you could accelerate your sail would be the velocity at, at which those things hit you, because otherwise you'd be moving faster than the thing that's trying to hit you, right, and yeah. you would speed up faster. So yeah. I think to get to the speed of light, you have to have something that's going the speed of light to help you move forward. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about the materials then. So, sure. you know, we sort of said that you need 
the best possible mirror because literally really that's what it is right you're putting a mirror in space yeah and then you're zapping it with a laser right and the problem is the mirrors are heavy and they break and you get bad luck <laughs> so so what kind of material are you examining as a as a way for doing a solar sail Sure. So uh, there's a couple of different materials we're using, and I, I don't want to focus so much on the identity of the materials. We're using something called um, lithium disulfide and alumina. But what's more important than just their names is their properties. What attributes make for a very good light sail or solar sail? Um, let me just focus on light sails for now, because that's where I've spent most of my sure. time. Well, uh, I working. already said, you know, we, we're going to use them indistinguishably. So that sure. way, sure. you know. So for a light sail, uh, the first most important thing is it has to be very lightweight. Uh, if anything, even if it's the most reflective thing in the world, as you suggested, you, you put a perfect mirror in space, it's too heavy, you're never going to get it to accelerate. So it's got to be lightweight, so a low density. Uh, it needs to be highly reflective. And we can use two materials together to create a structure that is highly reflective. So um, uh, in this case, lithium disulfide has a high index of refraction. And if you want high reflectivity, you need to have a high index of refraction. Uh, so that's an important part of our sale. But uh, in general, it must be highly reflective. But in addition to that, uh, the sail is, is going to absorb at least some tiny, tiny fraction of the laser light that's incident upon it. Um, and we want to make sure that absorptivity is as low as possible. Uh, but even if it's as low as possible, it's still going to absorb some. And so that means that the sail is going to have to radiate away all that energy that it's absorbing. So uh, in addition to being uh, reflective at the laser wavelength, it needs to be uh, highly uh, emissive at all other wavelengths, uh, preferably wavelengths uh, for, that uh, are characteristic of thermal emission. So typically longer wavelengths than the laser uh, wavelength. So those are some important properties that the sail has to have. And that's part of our work has been trying to find the materials and, and show that it actually could work by building small prototypes. And just give a sense of like just how fine and lightweight this material would be. Sure. Uh, so. We're looking at a density, an aerial density of about 0.1 gram per meter squared. Uh, so uh, just think about the size of your kitchen table. Uh, maybe it's two or three meters squared. So that means that the film, if it covered your kitchen table, would weigh less than a gram. And a gram, it's you know one of those tiny little uh, metal blocks you played with in, uh, in science class to use your, your, your balance. So it, it's just the, um, the density is very, very light. Uh, you can contrast that with solar sails, which are, are sometimes as, as much as 10 grams per meter squared. Hmm. They're just built a bit differently and they accelerate more slowly. Uh, but for our case, trying to get to a uh, fifth the speed of light, we need it to be uh, very, very low density. Right. And so <clears throat> you've got this material that is 0.1 of a gram per square meter. Is that right? That's right. Um, so how thick is this? Like it's got to be closing in on, you could measure it in atoms thick. You can measure in atoms, yes. Uh, so uh, the, what we're working with right now has uh, on the order of, um, say, 10 nanometers of alumina, and then uh, on the order of uh, 70 nanometers of uh, molybdenum disulfide, and then another 10 nanometers of um, alumina on top. So just call it 100 nanometers thick. Of course, a nanometer is about 10 uh, atoms. So we're, yes, I mean, you can easily measure it uh, yeah. with, with atoms. And and. And what is the manufacturing process that that actually is able to generate this? Sure. Uh, so uh, there's a number of tricks that we're using to to, to build our sail prototypes, uh, and I, I can't reveal those quite yet sure. because we're no working on a, a paper right now. But uh, but at a high level, um, what we do uh, is we we use techniques that can lay down films on silicon substrates atom by atom, and so one of those is called atomic layer deposition. Uh, essentially, it involves uh, a, a couple gas phase reactions that will uh, meet on a surface and deposit an atom. And then those uh, they're called precursors, and the precursors fly away. And that happens over and over and over again. Mm. And over the course of hours, you can build up a film that's uh, nanometers thick on a silicon substrate. And then the, the trick is knowing how to actually get the film off the silicon substrate. And that's where a lot of the magic happens. Uh, and and uh, I, I'm not going to talk too much about that now. Sure. Uh, but basically, atomic layer deposition um, is one technique. Another one is called sputtering. Uh, you can take a metal and you can put a plasma next to it. And uh, the plasma atoms hit this metal and knock off atoms. Those atoms fall down and hit the surface and they stick to it. 
So uh, this is a few different techniques that we're using uh, to generate these right. films. And the tricky part is peeling the the film off of the of what you were attached to originally. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. In you know, in principle, it's actually not peeling. It's more like uh, you know, there's other processes we well, use. But yes, you can think of it that yeah, way. Yeah. Yeah. That's well. That's what I'm going to describe it as until you reveal sure. the the secrets. Um, okay. But so then, like, how long does this take? How slow is this process? Yeah. So uh, if I want to deposit, uh, say, a film that's uh, 500 nanometers. I would have to take uh, about 12 hours of time on the tool uh, to do that. Uh, so we're, we're talking about, and, and just to, to put this in context here, um, to, help, to help everybody out, um, one of your human hairs here is uh, about 100 microns thick, and there's 1,000 nanometers in one micron. So we're talking about something that's five orders of magnitude thinner than uh, your hair, right? Uh, or maybe, maybe four orders of magnitude thinner, and it takes us 12 hours to make it. So it's very, very slow. That's that's the <laughs> yeah. idea. Now, like, like how long would it? And you're not talking about like a square meter. You're talking about just a tiny little amount, right? Right. We're making small uh, samples right now to test the optical properties and to show that this is a viable uh, method of, of making the sale. If we were actually going to build these, uh, you know, dinner table sized sales on the order of one to ten square meters, we would need to specially fabricate. Uh, Specially designed machines that could handle um, much larger sections of sale. In principle, we'd probably stitch them all together to make the actual sale. Uh, but yes, uh, right now there, our prototypes are very small. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so you you sort of started to answer my next question. So so based on the requirements of of what Breakthrough Starshot is is expecting, how big are you expecting these sales to end up being? Yeah. Um, so there's a number of trade-offs that go into the size of the sale. Uh, but just to directly answer your question, uh, we envision a sale that has an area of about, uh, say, 1 to 10 square meters. And so you can think of that as, uh, on the small side, roughly the size of your dinner table, on the large side, the size of your dining room. Uh, right. That's about how big the sale is going to be. And then there's a few reasons for that, uh, but that's the size. And and it would end up weighing about, say, if it is the size of, of a room, it's still probably a little less than a gram that's right our mass budget for the sale is one gram one gram and the mass budget for the tethers that connect the sale to the chip and the chip itself is one gram so we're talking about things that are extremely lightweight so you've got a you've got a one gram sale that is the size of a room that has some tethers and is holding a potentially one gram chip so i guess that was my next question is was payload um yeah so you can take a gram that's the payload. That's the gram. Yes, you can, you you get to bring one gram, one gram of instruments and communication devices and power equipment all the way to Proxima Centauri. That's what you get. Right. Capable of transmitting all the way back to Earth across four point three light Two. years. Four point two six. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, actually, one thing that helps us here is that we don't have to go all the way back. Uh, we can do a relay system where yeah. we launch one of these and then a few minutes later launch the next one or, or days later, whatever you choose, yeah. um, such that they don't have to communicate the whole distance, perhaps only uh, one light year if you launch four of them yeah. so or three of them. So uh, we can cheat a little bit. Yeah. I actually posed that question to Avi Loeb a couple of years ago and because that was my big concern. is like if you send these things away, you're never going to be able to talk to them. And he said, no, no, you actually – with a directed beam pointed back to Earth, you could receive the communications even across that kind of, of distance. And so, in theory, with a really big radio telescope directed towards them, we should be able to receive the signals. So, Yeah, I mean, my specialty is not the communications aspects, but there are very smart people working on that yeah, problem. Uh, yeah, and it's, yeah. It's difficult, but uh, they they seem to indicate that there's potential at least. So, yeah. Yeah, that's that's what I heard. And, you know, the issue with the relay, of course, is that you then need a really good transmitter and you re need a really good receiver. And if it only right. has to transmit, right. then you don't have to worry about receiving. And even being able to receive across a light year takes a pretty big dish. And so it that's might right. very well be that all you do is you just send the signal back to Earth and then you just keep building bigger and bigger dishes until until the signal is 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 coming in loud and clear. Um, yep. So I want to talk about the lasers. Sure. Um, uh, now you you mentioned this already that was it 100 
gigawatts. Was that right? 100 gigawatts. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So how many 100 gigawatt lasers have ever been built? Well, uh, the answer is zero. <laughs> uh, well, actually, uh, let me take that back. Uh, I, to be to be quite honest, I don't know. What I was trying to answer is how many hundred gigawatt lasers of that size have been built. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I think I think the answer is basically no. Yeah. Nobody has ever developed a laser that's on this on this size scale. Uh, I guess I was thinking of well, could yeah. something at the ignition facility uh, at uh, at Lawrence Livermore have even come close? I don't even think so. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the answer is no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know that that fairly powerful like there's been uh, a 10 petawatt laser was built in Romania okay um, but they're they're going for a very short period of time they're just exactly going up so how yeah, it's not continuous way right and so so how long would you need to be firing this 100 gigawatt laser at the solar sail for it to right. achieve its at its speed right so uh, well, let's just look at the uh, let's just look at the sail as it accelerates. The first photons that hit it move it a little bit, uh, and they accelerate it a little bit. But it takes you know a, a continuous stream of photons hitting it to actually move it into the target velocity, and uh, the, that that's basically called the acceleration time. Uh, the acceleration time for one of these sails is on the order of ten to thirty minutes. Uh, and uh, anything longer than that, we think would just be uh, impractical from a laser design standpoint. Um, uh, but uh, that's that's the rough order of magnitude that we're talking about here. And so how far is your sail going in 30 minutes at a yeah. significant so, fraction? So that's called the light. acceleration length. Uh, and that distance uh, is on the order of uh, about uh, 10 gigameters, uh, perhaps 30 gigameters, or, or, or to put it in a, a better way, uh, 10 million uh, kilometers. Uh, did I do the math right there? Yeah, it's it's on the order of right. millions of right. millions of kilometers. It's so a long way. part, you know, like part way to Mars. Uh, yes, yes. It, yeah. it's several Earth Moon distances. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So th I mean, that's actually you know, I was sort of envisioning that it would be farther that you'd have to be going all the way out to the outskirts of the solar system. But but the fact being that you would you would have to stay still stay on target seems like quite a challenge as you're accelerating this this thing away from you because you're right. having to hit so a actually fairly there small. are there are proposals for longer acceleration lengths but there's some problems with that and uh, one of those as you mentioned is the ability to stay on target uh just to, to put a, a little bit more specificity to that um the idea is that uh diffraction limits the size to which you can focus uh, a group of lasers uh, and so if you have an acceleration length that's extremely long uh, you know, even longer than uh, millions of, of kilometers in this case, then the size of the laser array on Earth has to be much, much greater. Uh, we're already talking about a laser array diameter of on the order of a few kilometers. But to make the acceleration length even longer because of diffraction problems, you'd have to have tens of kilometers, which is just impractical. Nobody mm -hmm. could ever build that or pay for it. So uh, we have to actually have these shorter acceleration lengths. It's a critical figure of merit for light sails because we need to build lasers that can actually do the acceleration. That's the idea. Does does it make? I mean, it's possible to have these lasers on the surface of the Earth. Is it? Would it be better to have them in space? Right. So that's a question other people have asked, and I think some of the earlier proposals did talk about that. But then you start to think: Do you really want to, <laughs> to have a big group of lasers in space that you know could be turned? Sure. What's the worst that can happen? Earth? Yeah. I mean, nobody wants that. Yeah. So. Just from a practical standpoint, no, we can't do that. Right. But, but, you know, I mean, obviously we're kind of in a point in history where people are a little concerned about uh, global security. But yeah. purely from an engineering standpoint, like less atmosphere is better? Yes. Yeah, like put it out on the moon, on the far side of the moon. That can't be pointed at the Earth. Yeah. Then you're I fine. mean, so, so that's one, one possibility is the far side of the moon or... You know, we're, we're a ways away from actually putting a base on the moon. But if we ever get there, that would be a potential uh, avenue of attack, actually. Does, uh, in fact, the atmosphere poses some really difficult uh, problems for the laser. Uh, you know, when you, you look over a, a hot stove, you see the air that kind of waves. That's because the index of refraction of the air changes and it bends the light. And the same thing happens in our atmosphere. The lasers have to be able to predict what that beam steering is going to be and adjust their trajectory 
prior to the photons going through that gas. It's a difficult problem. And so would that would that give you a shorter firing time, a less powerful laser to get the same job done? Let me see if I understand the question. You're saying that if we had it on the moon, could we use less power? Less power, less acceleration time. Like what would be the benefit? The benefit to being on the moon, I think, would be uh, that you wouldn't have to deal with the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Right now, the reason we've selected the wavelength uh, of the laser that we have, it's 1.2 microns, uh, is that that is a, a position, it, uh, the, the atmosphere absorbs very little light at that wavelength. And so more of the light would make it through as opposed to getting scattered or uh, being absorbed by uh, the gases in our atmosphere. We'd have a lot more freedom to pick a, a wavelength that perhaps would allow us to design the sail uh, in a more favorable uh, hmm. wavelength range. Do you, do you know what would be like a better wavelength I'm, or has that just not been studied? You know, I didn't look into that. Uh, I, I was focused on an Earth-based laser array. And so right. that's the 1.2 micron laser wavelength guided our design. If you open the space back up, I think there's probably been uh, some work on that before. I could I could try to find out. But yeah, no, no, it's, head, it's fine. The, the, it, it's possible it's out there, which is which is fine. So I want to talk about the shape. So, you know, the story, yeah. the press release that went around with your research was about the shape of the sail. So can you talk about that? Yeah. Great. Uh, so uh, if you're if you're going to design a reflector for space and you want to maximize the thrust you get by throwing photons at it, most people think that what you need is a flat sail. And that's because uh, just two simple reasons. One, if you have a flat sail, then all the photons come in and leave at the same angle in principle. And so you get the most uh, momentum transfer that way. That's sort of the direct answer. But the second that uh, may, may not be as obvious is that the reflectivity of a surface actually uh, often decreases as you move off the perpendicular um, uh, angle. And so if your surface isn't, uh, if the photons don't hit normally, then uh, the amount of photons reflected as opposed to absorbed actually decreases. So most people up till now have thought, well, this sail needs to be flat. That, that mm -hmm. maximizes the reflectivity and can uh, decrease the time that the sail needs to accelerate, decrease the time the lasers have to be on, everybody wins. But then we started to look at uh, the mechanics of the sail. In other words, if you had a flat sail, if you wanted to stay flat, what kind of stress and strain would that sail undergo? And we found that there's almost no conditions in which a flat sail will survive. In fact, when hmm. I say almost, I mean there aren't any. Um, right. A flat sail is subject to bending stresses. And those bending stresses, uh, a, a little thin sail isn't designed to, to um, handle those kind of bending stresses. Instead, a very thin uh, uh, fabric or, or sail is much better at tolerating something called membrane stresses, which is when they stretch or they pull uh, from within. Instead of going like this, they pull uh, this way in almost in tension. Uh, and you can see this in the sailboat. Uh, all the sails in the sailboat are at least in some way billowing. They're, they're undergoing membrane stresses that, as the uh, air pushes them out or a parachute. You can look at that as an example. And you can even look at a pressure vessel if you have um, say a propane tank for your gas grill. They're all round. And the hmm. reason they're round is because the rounded shape allows them to hold that pressure more safely. That's... Uh, it, yeah. So anyway, uh, that, that's the, that's the idea we had that we need to have curved sails instead of flat sails. Huh? That's really interesting. I'm sort of, you know, I'm, I'm a sailor and, and when you sail and you have the sail very taut, you can really feel the forces on the sail and on the boat. And it feels mm -hmm. very, kind of unstable and when you get a little more billow going it almost you feel it feels like the boat is kind of catching the air like a catcher's mitt and it feels like it makes things i don't know settle down a bit and there's That's less force pulling on the various pieces of the sail and now i think i guess i understand that that you're essentially taking these forces that are pushing against your fabric and instead of it being just a flat sheet that you're hitting up against, you're spreading those forces over a larger surface area and it's allowing the, I guess, the flex to handle it a little better than if it was just just straight on. So is there sort of a perfect shape where where now you're you sort of gone into you've got too much sail territory to provide the the thrust? 
Yeah, so um, that's a, you've, you've raised a whole bunch of different uh, ideas here. Uh, so let me just t take one of them here. What's the ideal shape? Um, so the ideal shape, uh, for a number of reasons, we believe to be, uh, needs to be curved. But what kind of curvature should it have? Yeah. Uh, if, if you think of it being too curved, as you uh, suggested, then all of a sudden you're carrying along extra mass because, uh, you know, so it, let's pretend you had a cone, for instance. You're not getting much out of the very tip of that cone, so that's, that's too extreme. Um, on the other hand, if it's too flat, then the stress has become too high. Uh, and so uh, th there are a number of trade-offs that go into uh, the, the design of a sail. Uh, another one is uh, when those photons come off, in the case of a, a light sail in particular, um, they need to be actually focused toward a point. Uh, if they don't focus toward a point, then what happens is as the photons hit the sail, instabilities cause that sail to fall off the laser beam. Right. And because we're talking about things moving at the speed of light, you can't correct the laser beam to track the sail because the information can't travel fast enough from the sail back to earth to tell the laser move because the sail fell off it's too late already so the sail has to be passively stable to ride on the beam a curved sail provides that for you huh. um, but there's other kinds of, of curvature as well you could have a parabola you could have a spherical curvature uh, we just for for the sake of simplicity chose to use a spherically curved sail uh, it just made some of the math easier uh, but in principle i think a parabolic shape is probably the way to go it does a better job focusing the light and i think future studies should investigate that uh in particular yeah so uh, it, the, this example of it of it focusing the light you know and again i'm sort of envisioning you shoot your laser at a flat disc say and if you don't have it perfectly balanced the the <laughs> sail is going to receive more of a thrust on one side or the other yep. and turn it and then yep. it's no longer and crumple it and then it's done. That's right. But but is there like an almost self-correcting mechanism as you're shooting the laser into some kind of curved parabola or, exactly. or spherical shape? That's the idea. So let's pretend you have a curve. Uh, if the laser is this wide, I, I don't know if you can see my hands now, but if you move over a little bit, then suddenly the thrust here decreases, but the thrust here increases, that, uh, that, would, that would cause the... Um, what am I trying to do? If the laser beam is larger than the sail, let's go that way. Right. If you move yeah. over, the thrust changes and it and, and moves back. Uh, you can you can simply uh, you can look at the uh, you can look at the math, or you can just think about it. Practically speaking, um, if uh, if your sail shifts around in its curve, then uh, as it moves over, the photons on one side will cause it to move back in the other direction. So uh, it's self-correcting. Yeah. Hmm. Um, that's really interesting. So you know. And I know there's like a lot of different pieces of the puzzle today. How far do you think this technology could scale up? Do you think we will always be stuck with one gram payloads? Or do you think that there's a larger scale that would be possible? Well, I mean, the, the, the fundamental physics are what they are. I mean, we just have... Uh, we have these photons that hit the sail and have to accelerate it. And, uh, you know, force equals mass times acceleration. And if you want a high acceleration rate uh, and you're looking at uh, the, the photon force, which is pretty small, then you need to have uh, a very low mass. So uh, in some ways, we're kind of stuck. Uh, but um, you know, per perhaps there's, there's, there's other ways around it. Uh, if we had uh, even larger sails, for instance, uh, then uh, maybe they could tolerate uh, a larger... Um, a larger laser force, and that could allow you to accelerate faster. But of course, if you make the sail uh, too large, uh, then basically it becomes atomically thin, and so there's no material there at all. Uh, the thinnest you can make the sail is virtually one angstrom. Uh, <laughs> so that's a few orders of magnitude lower than what we have now, but you're not, we're not very far off from that. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I don't know how much, how much room there is to, to move, uh, but some people have talked about trying to, to propel even spaceships using this sort of technology, but uh, it, it's a bit far out there from my understanding. I guess that's what I'm wondering. Like, like, like why was a, a gram payload the number that was, that was chosen? Could there be a 10 gram payload and then a sail that would, that would go along with it? Like, I don't know. I'm sort of thinking about like on earth, right? Like, like an elephant is about the largest possible land animal that you can have that, that, you know, dinosaurs, I guess are a little bit bigger, but at a certain point you've got too much volume pushing too much mass pushing down legs get too thick and you just can't go any bigger. We couldn't have a, an animal the size of a, 
I don't know, of a building or a mountain. <laughs> um, so, um, like if you could scale down the thickness of the sail, or if you could go larger, do you, do you feel like there's like a limit? Like, I guess, I guess where I'm getting at is like the, the Holy grail is to send something that could go into orbit at its destination and stick around and not just fly by at 20% the speed of, of light. And that's going to require right. a more complicated spacecraft. So could we send a ton of payload using this method? I think maybe the best thing to say is in principle, it, it, it might be possible, but, um, I think then the trade-off would be um, that either we'd need incredibly massive lasers uh, or uh, longer acceleration times. Hmm. Um, longer acceleration times because uh, if you had the same laser with the same sail, it would take longer to accelerate a larger payload or larger lasers because uh, you just need to have more force to, to move that much mass. Um, but, but again, you know, the sail itself has to be able to tolerate uh, this kind of uh, photon flux hitting it. And I'm not sure that we have materials today that could, uh, that could do that uh, with a larger payload, uh, trying to achieve similar acceleration times. Now, it could be that in the future, we're able to fabric, uh, fabricate atomically perfect uh, sheets of uh, films over, uh, you know, multiples multiple square meters of area and if that's uh if that's possible then we have something to talk about but right now uh i think limiting ourselves to one gram uh or, or maybe a handful maybe 10 grams at the mm -hmm. most might be the best we can do yeah I'm, i guess i'm just sort of imagining like you know if the let's say the manufacturing <clears throat> gets solved and you're and you're producing as much of this stuff as you want <laughs> um, uh, maybe you make it, you know, at a certain point, there's going to be just like a practical limit to how this stuff can even hold up its, its strength. But it, I guess what it sounds to me like what you're driving at is that if you want a bigger payload, you're going to need a longer acceleration time, either a, a, a more adaptable laser that can stretch the time period over a long period of time or multiple lasers that will pick up the job as the, as the probe is heading out of the solar system. Perhaps. Uh, and and uh, we have talked about uh, uh, laser systems where the diameter increases over time. So if you have a ring of lasers that accelerates initially, then larger and larger concentric rings uh, of lasers turn on. So that's a possibility. Uh, but just to, to answer your question, um, yeah, I think that uh, the, the longer acceleration time with the current sail technology we have now is probably the only feasible way of doing it. Um, and, and actually, that, that actually uh, might might work out favorably uh, because there's a few other considerations at play. One of them is the most efficient way to accelerate one of these sails is to have the uh, sail mass be approximately equal to the mass of the payload. And so if your payload mass hmm. goes up, all of a sudden you're able to have, uh, you're able to efficiently have a sail which is um, larger in area, assume it's the same thickness uh, so it doesn't vaporize. Uh, and uh, if that's the case, then uh, now uh, you can accelerate the, you can have a longer acceleration length because now your laser can still see the sail from a further distance away because the sail is larger. Remember, there's that diffraction limitation. Yeah, right. There's a whole bunch of things that, that are floating around. It's, it's a complex problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously, you know, each of these pieces are going to be, you know, how do you mi miniaturize the optics and electronics below a gram? How do you build, manufacture this material at a large scale? Um, how do you build a laser that can pump out that much power for that long period of time? Like, like these are not simple challenges and, and right. it, they're it makes incredibly it, difficult. Yeah. So, so let's imagine that we were, that this kind of technology was, a way that perhaps other civilizations were using to explore mm. the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. What what could we be looking for with our telescopes to try and see if this is going on? Right, and that's interesting because I think one of the previous uh, podcasts kind of talked about this. Um, so uh, I would expect that there would be um, coherent flashes of light, uh, flashes uh, that last on the order of uh, minutes to hours. Um, that's probably what we'd expect to see, and uh, if, if a civilization was, uh, was intelligent, they would probably try to direct those toward 
star systems that they um, hypothesize could support life, and they might be looking at ours thinking, well, we think there's a good chance that you know, whatever their name for our sun is could do that. And so we might expect to see bursts of photons that last you know, a, a few minutes uh, directed toward our sun. Uh, now, the, the likelihood that we're going to see any of those is so vanishingly small. Mm -hmm. On top of everything else, if the universe is, what is it, billions of years old, the chance that the coexisting civilizations on different uh, star systems or that different, that different civilizations would coexist at the same time, I mean, even that is a small probability. It might be that some other uh, civilization existed and died out, you know, 10 million years ago. We'd never see them. Yeah. But anyway, I digress. Yeah, uh, that's yeah. what we'd look for. But but I mean, I guess it would have to be a probe sent directly at Earth. Like if it was a probe being sent towards some other star system, we wouldn't necessarily see it. The only exception to that is if there was scattered light. And and some people have proposed that light sails could use scattering of light instead of reflection of light. Uh, and so if that's the case, then you might see very brief flashes of, of light that were scattered away. And you could look at the uh, spectrum of the photon wavelengths to try to deduce where, uh, in, in what direction uh, they were scattered. But, but I think by and large, we would have to have it directed toward us. That's, that's the most straightforward way of answering the question. So, so you, can you explain that a bit better just on what, on what scattered light would mean? Yeah. Like what is the mechanism that's, that's using, like explain that a little better. Sure. So when you think about reflection, uh, there's the idea of um, diffuse reflection and specular reflection. Specular reflection is when a laser hits a mirror and it bounces off at the same angle that it, it, uh, it, it was incident. That's, you know, that's direct reflection. That's kind of what we have in mind for our light cell. But diffuse reflection is when that's what makes it so that even if sunlight doesn't shine directly in your room, the room still feels well lit because uh, there's diffuse reflection all over. Uh, and even that can be somewhat bright if you have enough laser power directed at something. It can, it, the diffuse reflection can still seem very bright. And doubtless, there's going to be some diffuse reflection off of our, uh, off of our um, light sail. It could be coming from uh, photons hitting the probe or hitting the tethers. Hmm. Um, and so there's, there, there could be a way of picking up that signal and trying to analyze it or look for it. Oh, that's really interesting. Um... So one of the, you know, I mentioned this sort of earlier, this idea of being able to slow your spacecraft. I mean, the, the, yeah. the sadness of, of you send the spacecraft and it zips through, it's able to take a few pictures and then, and then it's gone again. And I guess the next one arriving a week later <laughs> picks up mm -hmm. the job where it left off. Can you envision any way to get a spacecraft that could, that could go into orbit? Sure. Uh, well, actually, uh, very smart people b before us have thought about this question, and there are some ideas. So uh, one of them would be if you could have um, your sail in two parts, there's a central disc and there's a ring that goes around it. And if they were able to detach and the ring went on ahead, so now you could shoot photons at the ring and have those reflect towards your sail and hit the backside, and those photons would now be pointing in the opposite direction of the velocity of your sail, and those could be used to slow it down. Right. So that's one uh, direct way. I don't think it's easy, but it's been <laughs> proposed before. Yeah. Uh, and it's even been proposed uh, as a way of doing a return trip, that you could actually accelerate this thing enough that you could make your probe point right back to Earth and then catch it once it got here. Uh, now, whether that would actually work or not, I don't know, but that's one way. Another way is using other more natural methods of deceleration. Uh, for, for example, if you could uh, use the gravity of a planet, obviously we, we know that it takes a black hole to even bend light, but, but perhaps there's something there. Uh, I don't know what it would be, but there might be other ways of doing this. Uh, it, it might not be a lost cause. The, the idea that I heard that was kind of interesting was um, that you would, have, you would deploy a mag sail. So you would, you know, once you had gotten up to velocity, you ditch the solar sail, and then you deploy a second sail, which would be a mag sail that would interact with the interstellar medium, which would be okay. uh, ionized particles. And you mm -hmm. would it would essentially cause a drag on the sail that. Then yeah, I would, mean, that that's would, a possibility. Yeah. Using uh, or, or I mean, there's there's the, the interstellar medium is full of dust. It could just be that all that dust could be used to slow down our, our 
sale as well. Yeah. So yeah, there's many different ideas. Now, a question I get from a lot of people when they hear this idea is, what about dust, debris, sand, stuff out in space? What kind of a hammering would the solar sail take as it was on this journey? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, I, I'm not the authority on this. There's been two wonderful papers published talking about dust and other uh, interstellar forces that might uh, act on this sail. So based on what I've read, um, the, the dust is a significant problem. Uh, and one reason that uh, a one gram probe and a one gram sail are nice is that you can make many, many, many of them. You, you manufacture a hundred and you shoot them all and you hope that one of them makes it. Right. Uh, so so it, it is a problem, but we can say a few more things. Um, when a piece of dust hits our sail, uh, it's likely to just punch a hole in it. Uh, and if we can design the sail material such that it's robust to punctures, uh, and I think there's ways of doing that uh, by having, for example, a microstructure that uh, gives it more rigidity than just a flat film. Um, perhaps that's a way of allowing it to survive. And then in terms of the, the chip itself that's being towed, uh, it's likely that that would need some kind of ablative shield. Uh, it would need a shield on the back side so the photons don't heat it up too much, and on the front side, such that uh, when dust hits it, the shield gets ablated away rather than uh, the instruments. So I think that both, uh, all these ideas are important and they need to be addressed, and some, some good scholarship has been done uh, talking about it already. Um, one of the other ideas that, I, that I've sort of heard is like, it's the like if you want to go like here in the solar system, for example, if you want to be able to go into orbit around some other world, you have to take a slower trajectory, one that allows you, you know, when you think of like the home and transfer to go from Earth to Mars, that you have to take it a slower uh, trip so that you can end up in orbit around your your destination. Um, hmm. And so are there slower trajectories like you know, the talk is always like, let's go. I guess people want it done in their lifetime. The the researchers, they want it. They want to be able to see it go and then do their work. And then 20 years later, report on the results. Um, right. But are there better trajectories that would bring some of the engineering issues back under control if they're if they're too extreme? OK, um, well, so I'm trying to think about how how to how to address this. Um, off the top of my head, what comes to mind first is that uh, there's only a certain number of forces that can act on this thing in space. There's the dust that hits it or the, the interstellar medium, the magnetic forces, gravity, and there's the laser photons. Uh, yeah. There might be other light that hits it as well. And you know, the laser photons are going to, by and large, act in a straight line. Uh, it, and uh, so in terms of altering the trajectory, I'm not sure there's too much we can do. I mean, maybe if you could uh, find very massive objects. You could just bend the trajectory a little bit, and that might be the best you can do. But I think a straight shot is what we're in for. Yeah. However, we could try to, uh, or we could simply use lower uh, power lasers and or, or use a, a larger payload, and that would cause our sail to accelerate more slowly. Perhaps what we do is we, we send this thing out and say in 100 years, the data will come back. And in the meantime, we're going to work on designing the, the uh, antenna that's going to pick up the signal from this poor little chip, you know, right. four uh, light years away. And in the meantime, what somebody else does is they probably develop the warp drive and they go and chase this thing down and pick it up before it meets, yeah. you know, they, they pass it. Or we develop a, uh, an even larger antenna on Earth, maybe a, a, a 100 kilometer um, a telescope lens, and we just take the picture from a satellite orbiting Earth. I mean, maybe that'll yeah. work too. So there's all sorts of questions right now, and I don't know all the answers to yeah. them uh, about this. But but yeah, in principle, there's some there's some knobs we could play with. Yeah. Have you have you ever read the paper about the weight calculation? You sort of uh, hinted at it do you there. Remember with, the title or the author? That's the the title is called the the weight calculation, and the gist of it is oh. that is is what you said, which is like you send a you send a crew of colonists to go to Alpha Centauri, and they you know they're in the journey for for three hundred years, <clears throat> and then the faster spaceship comes along and picks them up or waves to them as it goes by. <laughs> um, and then, and you know, because they're going to make the journey in only 200 years. And then <clears> hundred <throat> years later, the next ship goes by to, to meet them and, and pick them up. And, you know, based on the research that if you just sort of take the energy expenditure of planet earth over 
the historical lifetime of humanity and just plot it as this exponential curve. Um, you get to this point, and if you sort of imagine the amount of total energy that would be required by a, a modern or a, you know advanced civilization to send a spacecraft to a nearby star system without completely bankrupting themselves, mm -hmm. you, and taking that idea of the weight calculation in mind, you end up with this magic number, and it's about seven hundred years away from now. Like huh. you know, like if you just continue on that 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 any spacecraft sent sooner than that number will be overtaken by a spacecraft that is built cheaper that will get there first and, but there is wow. this final time frame where nothing will be able to get there faster that that right. you know for an equivalent amount of of money yeah it's it's weight w a i t the weight calculation and it sort of goes Got into it. this idea i was idea. thinking w e i g h c the no, weight no it's w a i t okay. the weight how long should you wait yeah. And before yeah. you send you know, and, the, and the spacecraft. I don't I don't think I've read that paper in particular, but I have uh, I've seen what probably are commentaries on the idea, because I'm sure multiple yeah. people have thought about this. Yeah. And some people say, well, you know, even if something is going to surpass the ship, you might as well send something now because you don't know or or maybe uh, it's worth the experience. And, and so that's a big trade off. And yeah. I don't actually intend to claim that I know the answer, but I think it's worth thinking about at least. Yeah. Uh, and so as we kind of go back to the you know I, I i sort of proposed this idea back at the beginning and you know we're sort of nearing the end of the of the conversation you know like i would love to see pictures of alpha centauri or proxima centauri yeah. or whatever like it would be one of the most incredible images we could ever possibly see but it yeah. but it feels weird to me that we're going after this objective without taking this technology to its limit here in the solar system um, and I, you know, I understand like a big goal is something that's really exciting and something to, to move forward, but it feels like the technology that you're working on is going to transform the exploration of the solar system. How, could. how would you adapt what you're doing to be more useful here in the solar system? Sure. Um, well, I think, uh, again, if your lasers are going to be on earth, you'd probably have to have the sail, uh, have. Uh, at least similar uh, physical properties. Um, but perhaps, uh, you know, now the acceleration length, the acceleration time aren't important anymore because right. uh, who cares if it takes you, uh, you know, five minutes or, or, or five hours to accelerate the thing. You're still moving in our solar system quicker than uh, what, what uh, Voyager or one or two would do. Yeah. And so maybe you can relax the requirements a little bit. Uh, maybe your laser can be one gigawatt. And that actually would be a much more feasible. The laser wouldn't have to have a, a, a diameter of kilometers, probably uh, meters is all you'd need. Uh, and so I think that uh, doing solar system based uh, laser uh, travel is, is much more feasible. Uh, of course, there's still the questions of, uh, do, you, do you want to do it? Is it still better to send a nice big uh, space probe with rockets? Um, you know, that's, that's a question you can ask, but I think it's, that what we're developing, I think, certainly could be a system uh, with with some adaptations, and I think it would be much easier. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and then the lessons learned can then be adapted to the point that you can actually go and and go for the the full exploration right. of the of the of the Milky Way, which right. sounds like a next step. So, <laughs> this idea of von Neumann probes, I'm sure you've heard the term before. This idea of self replicating robot probes, mm -hmm. how like, do you think that this is the way we will send self-replicating robot probes across the Milky Way that, hmm. you know, because you, now you need to build a factory, right? You need hmm. to take a factory to your new star system that can build more of these things. Yeah. Potentially, but then you'd need to be able to not just have a, a, a little um, sail and a probe factory, but you'd also have to have an, a laser factory. And yeah. Yada, yada, yada. That, that's difficult. Um, but then again, I guess if you use rockets, you'd have to have a fuel factory. So right. um, I don't know the answer to that yeah. question. I mean, I, I wonder it's, what's it's the possible. minimum, yeah. like what is the minimum technology required to bootstrap? Like you could send one cyanobacteria to a planet that was kind of Earth-like but was mm -hmm. devoid of life, and you come back a few years later and the whole thing's covered in cyanobacteria. And so cyanobacteria... Mm. And it, then it evolves into more complex life forms. I wonder what the minimum 
robot factory would be to let you bootstrap up to a more complicated structure that would uh, actually produce spacecraft. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it, 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 I'm not sure I'm the most qualified person to answer that. It's, <laughs> no, no, yeah, that's, I mean, that's why we're in the last like four minutes of this conversation. And so, you know, I, now I get to ask you questions funny. you don't really, you can't answer. <laughs> but maybe this will turn so, into your next paper, so who knows? There we go. Yeah. There we go. We'll start working on robotics yeah, awesome. for interstellar travel. Well, Matthew, it's really exciting. I really appreciate you sort of getting a chance to, giving me a chance to ask every single solar sail question that I've ever had, which was great. Um, great. If people want to keep track of your work, what's the best way to do that? Well, uh, let's see. Uh, our research group has a website here at Penn. It's just bargatin.seas.upenn.edu. I'm sure we can put that in the yeah, comments. Yeah, I think I put a link in the, um, in the show notes already, yeah. Uh, I've got a website that uh, keeps track of my CV and the publications I've done, so we can put that there as well. Um, but, uh, but in general, I think you know, more than just you know, following our work, I think uh, you know, keep, I would say to the audience, uh, you know, keep your eyes on, on what interests you and uh, keep your eyes on the stars and, and we'll just see, we'll see where we go over the next 10, 15, 100 years, who knows? Fantastic. Well, Matthew, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with you today and good luck with uh, a lot. being part of the team that sends the first spacecraft to Proxima Centauri. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Thanks All a right. lot. All right, take care. Bye.